So I get to, to kick um, this off with a little bit of a nudge to focus on commerce and the economy. Um, and to do so, sort of kicking off talking about the economy and the, the shadow of the wellbeing budget. The economy is actually really, really important for wellbeing. It doesn't matter too much um, how you measure it or where you start from. Um, we all know about the limitations of GDP, but it's worth being aware that whether you consider well-being in terms of people's subjective perceptions here, or whether you look at the sorts of different outcome measures that are underpinning Treasury's Living Standards Dashboard, I use the OECD here because they've already put all this together, there is a really strong relationship between GDP per capita now and current well-being now. So if GDP and the economy are important for well-being, what does the well-being agenda have um, for climate offer for climate change? So the key thing to understand here, and I guess my main point, my how is in the middle, is that the well-being agenda is about bringing a bunch of off-balance sheet costs and benefits onto the balance sheet. In a sense, it's a, it's a similar, in fact I think arguably it's another stage in the same process in the 80s when the government bought a number of its off balance sheet liabilities to within its, its accounting regime, its current accounting regime. And in doing so there are two sorts of things it's bringing within the scope of, of what policy counts. This is how I think about it, that the capital stocks model, I've got two versions of it there, the OECDs and the Treasuries, they're basically the same apart from the details. But the thing they emphasise is that there are two things you've got to keep track of. One is people's well-being. The second are the resources on which that depends over time. And the thing to keep in mind with climate change is these two things can be in tension with each other, right? We can run up our current well-being now by burning a lot of oil, cutting down a lot of trees, which is going to leave future generations with a smaller pool of resources. And you can do the reverse if you're, if you're particularly, uh, if you have the mind. The, the example that links to mind, not with building up natural capital, but the Soviet Union in the 30s, right? Built up its produced capital, lots of tractor factories um, at the expense of the, the well-being of its population. This is one way to think about the tension, that the capital stocks model. It's not the only... I like it because I think there's a little bit of a structure there and you can ask about the trade-offs. But some of you might have seen this, right? We had Kate Raworth here in New Zealand the other week and her core point is the same point, that there is a tension here between meeting the needs of people now, well-being, and meeting the needs of the future, the sustainability or the capital agenda. So how successful, how successful has the government been in integrating this into the wellbeing budget? The thing to be aware of here is that this is a long-term agenda. Right, so I flicked through the, the budget statement to, um, today. Yes, you can look at the expenditure from a wellbeing perspective, and you'll see some things there, right? So there are, there are two things. There's an emphasis on mental health, which is strongly grounded in the wellbeing literature. Um, there's also a large tilt towards a longer time frame for infrastructure. But the big game here is not a one-budget game. Okay, the majority of any government spend is constrained by legislation. It's demand-driven. We have to provide health education, welfare. The long game is if adopting a wellbeing approach allows us to take better account and better manage the capital stocks going forward. So I have one main big insight, one main insight from the economics of wellbeing. I'm a wellbeing economist. I'm going to bring this up. This is, I think, I won't say defining. It is one of the key things we have to understand in thinking about how we manage climate change and how we manage the tension between 
meeting people's needs, current well-being, and managing the capital stocks. And that's that people's approach to gains and losses, wins and winning and losing, is asymmetric, right? This shows the impact on, on life satisfaction, standard measure of well-being for economic growth. And the main point is there is this big, huge kink at about zero. Economic growth, more stuff, is good for your well-being, not necessarily just because you accumulate stuff, but because it allows you to do more things which actually generate well, actual well-being, more time, better health. But the effect of losing income, the effect of a recession, is more than twice the impact of the same gain. And this has real implications for our adaptation path. It means adapting early has huge gains. If we're able to, if climate change adaptation has a cost, if we can do that early enough, so it just means lower growth, it has a very small impact on our well-being trajectory. If we put it off to the point where we actually have to take a loss, that's going to be a very large and negative impact to this. So there is a real pressure here coming from people's psychological approaches to well-being that says we need to act early, and the longer we put this off, the harder this is going to get, not just from the physical, the hard science, and there's all that coming to it, but from the soft science to it, right, how people approach this. Where I want to leave this, I guess, because this passes on, I think we've got institutions a little bit later, and I guess where I want to leave this and the, the tension between current well-being, I'm, I'm taking a broad view of commerce here, commerce, the economy, the economy is about people's choices and, and, and well-being is the, the income stuff plus the non-income stuff that matters. The concern I have, and I think the challenge for the, the, the um, institution people to pick up, is that our institutions are not good at long-term choices, right? We have a short electoral cycle, which tilts us towards the, the present. Um, we have, yep, and um, our business cycle tilts us towards, towards the present as well, our CE comp compensation. The only um, institution I can fact, the only legal person I can think of in New Zealand now that has an inbuilt um, long-term view is Te Urawera created as a, a legal person um, thinking towards the future. And the question I, I just want to leave with is how do you get within our institutional structure a voice for the future that enables us to pick up that change and make that early enough before the wellbeing costs get locked in? Thank you.